Hey, y'all. At the end of March this year, the Global Methodist Church, of which I am a member and I'm an elder within the GMC, it released a document called the Convening General Conference Community, which would be a guide for September's Convening Conference, how it's going to be uh, taking place, all the procedures and, and roles that are responsible for different things around it. TJ uh, Owens and I, who's my producer, we've been going through the document, and we're going to conclude it this time. This is our fourth time coming to this document, and TJ is raring to go. How are you feeling, brother? I am so excited today, if you can't tell. Um, I guess I'm kind of excited to get done with this. We'll get done with it today. Yeah, yeah. And we're not quite sure exactly how we're going to follow this up. We're thinking it would be good to go over the petitions we submitted, but also other people have written me saying, hey, would you cover my petition? So maybe we'll have a topic. Like they sent you their petitions to look at that they've submitted? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we could do that. Um, And then, of course, the legislative committees are going to be publicly reviewing the petitions submitted to them and why they either reject them or adopt them or edit them. So um, it should be a pretty transparent process that that people can engage so we'll see what we do at the end of last episode we invited people to email us any questions or input and uh, i've watched our inbox and i don't think that we've gotten anything substantial we, i've gotten some people uh saying why they think robert's rules is good and I, I that's very welcome and that's appreciated but i to my knowledge i don't recall anyone having any questions that they wanted us to follow up on so uh, i don't look at the email um i did look at the comments every once in a while look mm-hmm. at the comments um and there was one that was good because we were talking about the call to previous question uh, oh yeah yeah, time, yeah yeah um, and somebody actually answered that yeah they were really nice about it they said i see why you were confused about this it's, yeah, you it's idiot <laughs> but, uh, uh here's what it actually means so that was in the comments that would be great uh, for yeah us i'm to getting have. ready to pull it up so it was the what what is the question was like what is what is called the call the previous question like it sounds like it's you're on a question but you want to call the question that's already been voted on maybe it's not that at all um basically it's uh you want to call the previous question, you're in the middle of like debating the current question, but you want to call that same question up for a vote. You want to basically end debate um, and and vote on that question. So it's not technically the previous question, it's the question you're on. Yeah, um, right. Which I'm trying to... And the place find. where that came into play was on page 13 of the document, point 12. We were dealing with when a two-thirds vote is required, and it was point four under this to sustain a call for the previous question so it was highly procedural that context so i didn't feel the need to be 100 percent uh knowing what was going on but i i do remember being confused i don't know 10 years ago about this exact same phrase because it sounds like you're going back to a previous question when actually you're just voting on the motion before you but that's different from Another thing that I've seen done on the floor of plenary where someone says, I want to vote on all that is before us. So I don't know where the dividing lines are between calling the previous question and voting on all that is before us. I could have looked that up before we did this, and I didn't. So did you find the comment? Yeah, yeah. That was Carrie Wood. So Carrie, thank you. Um, Carrie is also one of the uh, people that... uh, was one of the first to fill out our petition, so he's oh, on great. a lot of our petitions. Yeah. Um, he's a, a GMC pastor, Goldston Methodist uh, Church. So thank you, Kerry. Yes, thank uh, you. I was going to read his, his comment, but it's it's a little it's a long, but it's it's very. We're going to have a short episode today, so go ahead and do it. I okay, yeah. Make he it said uh, your confusion regarding call the previous question is understandable. What I think it means is this: to call the question is not debatable before voting on the call but to actually move to the question requires a two-third vote previous in this context is not about going back to a matter already completed but to settle every motion on the floor as it currently stands as an example let's take one of your petitions submitted to the gmc the committee is considering whether to adopt the maximum salary recommended a person offers an amendment to make the maximum as 250% of average salary. Before the amendment can be adopted, someone else offers an amendment to the amendment that bishops (laughs) (laughs) be excluded from the 150%. After two speeches for and against, the bishop 
exclusion amendment. A delegate moves that the question be called for all that is before us. The presiding officer stops debate, asks the delegates to vote on calling the question. Two thirds or more agree to the call. The result is that is that they then will take three votes in a row. Okay. Without any okay. further discussion. It I'm so sorry way. I did this to y'all. <laughs> I told you it was long. I'm sorry TJ was right to not want to do it. Um <laughs> So I just know I know what's going to come into play when we're covering general conference. I know that there's going to be some nerd that makes this call, and I need to know what it means. What were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say if you want to if you want to read it, it's it's on part three of our question. It's it's uh, Reverend Kerry Wood. He's got he's got a, uh, and I could be just reading it poorly, which I'm I'm good at. Um, but You're so it, it's good more at being bad. Yeah, is that yeah, what you just said? Basically, now? okay. Um, I'm an illiterate Oklahoman. <laughs> Uh, but what I got out of it is essentially, um, all of this stuff is happening to this, this, uh, question and you just want to go back to the original and just vote on it. Yeah. I like that. I sympathize so, with that. Okay. I think I would be doing that all the time if I were at plenary, yeah. I would just call a question. Yeah. Let's so, so thank you again, Carrie, for that. That's, that was helpful. Yeah. And the reason that this matters, and we're going to deal a little bit more with this. We're, we're covering the last uh, two, three pages of uh, the document today, and it's going to continue to deal with Robert's Rules of Order. The reason it matters is because this very much impacts the way in which the discourse is held, and uh, we've already talked about the pros and cons around that, but um, there are some ways in which our eyes glaze over because it's not immediately important. But, man, when it comes up in the moment, somebody or it sounds like they've, like, made some kind of magical incantation whenever they do this. Like, if you don't know what that particular spell does, you're in trouble because they're about to do some voodoo and things are about to move in a certain direction that everybody doesn't know. So it's, it is my intention to brush up on this stuff before the general conference is September so that in commentary I can help everybody understand what's going on. I'd like to think it won't be necessary, but it probably will. Anything else to be said before we look at today's document. I don't think so. Okay. So we are we finished 12.3. We are now in point 13, which is non-debatable motions. I'll read first, and then TJ and I will go back and forth. So here's the page. If you want to download it, remember, go to so the world will know dot. Mm, is it com? Org? I think it's org. Hold on. Yeah. So don't worry. Yeah, it's dot org. Dot org. So the world, all one word, so the world will know dot org. You can download this document, follow along yourself. So on the floor of plenary, um, non-debatable motions, that's a motion that you, you can't debate on. If someone gets up, they say this incantation, then you can't debate on it. The following motions will be acted upon without debate. A, a motion to adjourn when unqualified, except for final adjournment. So somebody gets up and says, motion to adjourn. I just want to be done. Um, you can't debate on that. I don't understand what when unqualified means. Um, I think I think it speaks to it here in a little bit. I think it has to do with um, whether the work has been completed or you followed the calendar. I think I think you would have to like suspend the rules or something before doing this. So I think it's saying. Well, okay, maybe it'd be adjourning one session rather than the entire conference. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, it says you can't do the final the final adjournment. You can't. That's okay. not an option. But you can have an unqualified adjournment that you can't debate, but it needs uh, – it doesn't say if it would need a – it'd probably be a 50% vote, it looks like. A uh, simple majority, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Maybe we'll come back to that, but that sounds screwy. I don't know. Like, didn't that happen at the UMC when that lady just like, I want to go to lunch. It's time for lunch. And then they just like, okay, let's go. Yeah, but I don't think she made a formal motion to adjourn. Uh, maybe I she did. No, I don't think she did. But maybe the presiding bishop at the time is like, yeah, let's do this. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. yeah, no, because there wasn't a vote on it, I don't think. No. So he just decided. Yeah. I don't know. Point B, another uh, non-debatable motion is to suspend the rules. So you can't debate it. You just got to vote on it. C is a motion to lay or remove a motion from the table. 
So the table is just what's going to be before the plenary. It doesn't necessarily mean that's what you're doing right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're doing something right now, it's already on the table. Yeah. So. Yeah. You'd be adding or removing. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess you could remove it from the table if it's on the table. So if you're on, right. on, currently on something, say, hey, I'm going to remove this from the table. Get it out of here. Vote on it. Or do you think you could even, like, you've already approved, like, a, uh, a calendar for the day, but there's something up ahead that you don't want to vote on, so you can just say, hey, I'm I, I'm making a motion to take this off the table. I actually yeah, don't yeah wanna... I think that's the more common thing that would happen. Okay. That makes sense. I, I don't recall that ever happening, but to know that you could is cool. Um, point E, uh, to reconsider a non-debatable motion. So you already have one deba non-debatable motion. It passes or fails, and then later you can make a motion to reconsider it, and that's also not debatable. Okay, you don't get to debate. You just get to vote on it. So the the first one is a, a motion that you can't debate on. You get to vote on it. Yeah. Somebody votes it down or votes it up. You can call it back up and vote on it again, but not discuss it. <laughs> that's okay. how I receive it, yeah. I, I guess it, I guess that makes sense if there's like a break and you can kind of get your delegation together and be like, okay, you guys obviously had no idea what was going on. We're doing it this way. Actually vote this way this time. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, F, to limit or extend the limits of a debate. Okay, so it's limited to three, four, and three against. So... You can extend it to have more. So I thought you had to suspend the rules to do that. That's what I thought too. Yeah. Extend the limits of the debate. Maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's changing time, but I think that was also a suspending of the rules because you vote on this beforehand. Uh-huh. Um, okay. I mean, I mean, I recall last week saying I was going to try and get an expert on here with us that we could talk to. It seems like that is incumbent yeah. in order to figure this okay, out. Okay, so suspending the rules is more than just debates. So you could hypothetically suspend the rules and it would affect something else. This is just concerning debate. So you don't want to completely suspend the rules, but you want to change how the debate is set up. So yeah, so are you thinking that to suspend the rules means to none of the rules apply anymore and we're going to make all the new rules? Because that's not how I've understood that to be. Well, I, I think it I, – I would imagine you can pick a specific rule that you want to suspend. I don't think it's just all of them. Right, yeah. That's how I always took it. It's just like I got a problem with this particular part of the rules. I want to suspend the rules. I want to do something different over here, either extend this or – Limit it. Yeah, uh, maybe those are two. Maybe those two are connected. I don't know. Maybe they just added it on here because I do remember the debate option was a, you had to suspend the rules. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Point G to pause for prayerful discernment. So you can just make a motion to pause for prayer for prayerful discernment. Nobody can debate it. Wouldn't that be so sorry? If someone was like, I, <laughs> I want to debate against the motion to pray. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, well, I mean, hypothetically, you could have somebody that abuses that. Like, what are the what are the limits for? How long are we doing a prayer session? Kind of thing. Yeah. Like, how are you gonna? How long are you? If you're trying to like uh, essentially filibuster a, sure, uh, the time, then then it it still has to go up for a vote. So the the room can say, no, we're not having this filibustering. We're going to continue this forward. But that's not a debatable thing. Yeah, so it's a votable thing. Oh, you vote okay. on it. Gotcha. You don't debate it. Yeah. Yeah. There you okay. go. Okay. So that was point 13. 13. That's all the non-debatable motions. Anything else to say before we move on? I don't think so. All right. Take it away. 14, substitutions and minority reports. Resolutions or petitions may be amended by substitution provided that the substitute is germane to the topic and an alternative to what is before the body and not simply a negotiation negation. Or ne negation of the main motion. Substitute motions coming from a legislative committee minority would be in the form of a minority report, which is presented at the same time as the majority action of the legislative committee. Okay, so the legislative committee votes on a petition. 
there's the majority report and the minority report. The majority is obviously if who, however many, the majority of the votes. The minority is a minority of the votes. Mm-hmm. Um, so resolution or petition may be amended by substitution provided that the substitute is germane to the topic. Yeah, the, they control it. And this is good because someone who is snarky could get up and completely change the purpose of a, a petition or completely negate it, and that's not the thing to do. I mean, if you want to negate it, you vote it down when it comes time. You don't change, you don't put like a not, the word not where it's saying an affirmative or something. So it has to stay on topic. It has to try and achieve basically the same end. Um, and provided that's the case, then you can make an amendment. Okay. If, you, if you're following it, I wasn't following it. Yeah, it's just like say say you had a petition to like make all bishops wear pink shirts, and I got up and said, "I have an amendment to the petition. I want to insert the word not in here. They will not be expected to wear pink shirts, and that would do the exact opposite of what the petition says. That would not be germane to the topic. That would not be subject to becoming an amendment. I would at that point, if I were just wanted to do that, then I would be one of the speeches against." And I would vote against it. But no, I can't like get up and make an amendment to make it say the opposite of what it said. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's go to 14.1. Please don't anyone make our bishops wear pink shirts. That would be so <laughs> dumb. All right, go on. 14.1. The main motion or majority action of the legislative committee is presented first, followed by the presentation of the substitute. The main motion is perfected first by entering any proposed amendments, then the substitute is perfected by entering any proposed amendments. Entertaining. I said enter, entering. Entertaining any proposed amendments. Finally, the question is whether to adopt the substitute in place of the motion. Okay, so... The main motion, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I really like that they use the word perfected here. What we're doing is we're perfecting a petition through amendment the both the majority report and the minority report get perfected by amendment. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm I guess I'm confused. I, I, a petition has gone through the legislative committee. Yep. They vote on it. Then both, like the so the there's no amendment necessarily needed to the one the legislative committee votes on. I guess or both can be amended by the plenary. Sure. Sure. So the legislative committee is going to have a majority report or a, a, a report, and then it can it can have it doesn't have to have a minority report, but if it does have a minority report, that's dealt with. So in the minority report, those are amendments that the minority would like to see change change to that petition. Yeah, a different way of going about it, I think, um, and I think the report can even be against the amendment or a, against the uh, motion. Um, I know at least in a judicial setting, there will often be a minority report from a minority of uh, justices that say, actually, this was a bad decision, and we, we think you reached the wrong decision. Right. But that would then go on to uh, the plenary session to vote on either one of them? Uh, it sounds like that to me. It just seems... I, I would think if it's voted down, then it wouldn't even go... Okay, so these are ones that have voted, been voted through. Yeah. <clears throat> so they're, if it's voted down, it's not even going to go to them um, unless somebody yes. gets up and, and, and says, we want to vote on this. Yeah. Um, okay. I'd, uh, I don't think I have anything intelligent to add to that. It's just, you know, the, how are we going to make it? There's a majority report, there's a minority report. In what order do we entertain these? Uh, how do we come to a vote on them? So it's just dealing with the logistics of that. Okay. 14.2. If the motion to substitute prevails by majority vote, the substitute motion becomes the main motion. If the motion to substitute fails to receive a majority vote, the original motion, the original main motion remains pending until acted upon. So the substitute motion is the minority report, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yeah. So you, before you even entertain the main motion, you vote, the whole plenary votes on, do we want to replace the main motion with the substitute motion or the minority report? Yeah. And 
So that in that sense, it, it's almost like it gets preference. But if it does substitute it, then you vote on that again, up or down. And if it doesn't substitute it, then you vote on the main motion up or down. Whew, you guys better be paying attention. Right? <laughs> like a lot of room for confusion on this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I guess I for in my head that that was not even an option. It was like, okay, they they passed this this motion by a majority vote, and that's the only one you get to vote on. And then you can make amendments to it as it comes up. But this is like, okay, the minority of that legislative session has already substituted their what they think should be changed to mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. and you've got to vote on that. Yep. That just seems like a lot, and I, uh, it just seems unnecessary to me. Like, yeah. it's, there's the option to, to add amendments on the floor. Uh -huh. like. But this is a know. way of pri privileging the work of the legislative committee over the whatever uh, uh, ad hoc spitballing the plenary wants to do. Uh, yeah, I guess. Okay. Um, we are on 14.3. Motion for the previous questions. Question are not in order on a motion to substitute until opportunity has been given for at least two speakers on each side of the question. So this deals with calling the previous question. Which is what we talked about earlier. Kind of, but now it's saying that you can't really entertain that unless you've had at least two speakers on each side get a chance to talk, which I thought was weird. Yeah, I wonder why they did that. I don't know. I guess you, you, you could have the option to get up there and say, I, you, you presented the, the question, I call the previous question, let's just vote on it. Mm -hmm. Not even let the... Well, the so the substitute comes up first, right, though? Doesn't it? They vote on that? Um, if the motion of the substitute prevails my, by majority vote, the substitute motion becomes the main motion. Okay, the, the main motion or majority action of the legislative committee is presented first followed by the presentation of the substitute. So the main motion comes first. Yep. You vote on whether you want that. If they say, no, we don't want that, then you've got the option for the legislature. I don't think committee. you vote on, do you want that? I think you vote on amendments to that. And then once you've perfected it, then you go to the substitute amendment, and the substitute motion, and you amend that as well. But you don't vote up or down on the main motion until you've dealt with the substitute motion. You know? Yeah. I didn't realize this one was going to be as complicated right? as yeah. it is. Yeah. See, this is why I don't like Robert's rules. Uh, I don't feel like you have to do this with Robert's rules. Surely not. Surely these are these are um, options that yeah, options that the GMC has decided we're gonna we're gonna do it this way. The only way to know is uh, talk to an expert or get our own Robert's rules uh, book right. that we consult. So <sighs> But it's the process that we've got. And, it, and you, you balance different concerns. You need to make sure that minority voices are heard and dealt with rather than the majority carrying the day by default, I think. You know, that's kind of what the electoral college system is for in America. It's to make sure that two wolves don't get together and eat a minority lamb. You know, that's the way I've heard it explained. So we, we don't have like a clear majority rule, like mob rule, like we have to consider minority voices. Right, and right. this is a way of guaranteeing that we do. I suppose. Okay. Let's go on. 14-4. Mm -hmm. um, Delegates wishing to offer a minority report must notify the chair of the legislative committee in writing within one hour, excluding breaks, <laughs> of final committee action on the relevant petition. The notification of a minority report must be signed by five persons or 10% of the legislative committee membership, whichever is less, who voted against the proposal, whose names and email addresses must be attached to the written request. Delegates offering... Okay, so they don't have to submit a, minor, a minority report? Right. Okay. That's yeah. just an option. But, yeah, if they do want to submit a minority report, it has to be on this certain timeline. It has to have a certain proportion of names, either number of names or proportion of the committee, whichever is right. fewer. You get an hour to do this. you got to have at least five people or 10%, whichever's less. And, you know, ideally, the legislative committees have already done their work long before, and you've already submitted it. But it's just saying, here's the deadline for submitting it yeah. an hour before. Okay. 
14.5. Following notification of 14.4, the delegates must submit the actual proposed wording of the minority report. See also paragraph 14, introduction above. Okay, so just Which point we 14. did, yeah. Yeah. Accompanied by a rationale of up to 100 words. The minority report must be submitted by the printing deadline of the following of the day following notification, unless that day is the last day of general conference. If the following day is the last day of general conference, the minority report must be submitted as soon as possible, but no later than 10 p.m. on the day of notification, with the expectation that the report will be printed and distributed separately from the daily conference journal if necessary. So this kind of confuses me because I thought they had to, I thought the previous 14.5 was dealing with when they had to be at, it had to be, oh, it must notify the chair of the legislative committee in writing within one hour of the final committee action on the relevant petition. So, but then this is talking about getting the language, um, I guess, to whoever's responsible for printing it. So there's there's one deadline which is the final action of the legislative committee. Right. Then there's another deadline which is the day before the printing time of the day before it is to be considered at general conference. Oh yeah, I think so. Unless for some reason you're not presenting it until like the last day of general conference, in which case it's said to do what? Um no later than 10 p.m. on the day of notification. Um Okay. Yeah, if the following day is the last day of the general conference, the minority report must be submitted as soon as possible, but no later than 10 p.m. on the day of notification. Huh. Okay. I got nothing to say about that. Yeah, I guess so. You can't do it on the can't do it on the last day. Okay. Yeah, they should already have that stuff done. Yeah. Beforehand. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, you know, these 15 years. Oh, right, right, right. There's a long one, folks. Get ready. Reconsideration. A motion to reconsider an action of the body is in order at any time if offered by a delegate who voted with the prevailing side. If the motion proposed for reconsideration was not debatable or non-debatable, the motion to reconsider is likewise non-debatable. So there was a motion held, debated, and it passed. Right. Or it didn't pass. Well, no. No, if it passed and you voted for it to pass, yeah. then you can recon- you have the option to reconsider. If you s- said, no, I don't want it to pass, and it passes anyways, you don't get that option. Yeah, yeah. Like if there's new things that happen over the course of the conference where you're like, oh, this thing we passed before was right. – I voted in favor of it because I didn't know what I know now. I Now I don't think the body would be in favor of it. So as one who I, – I was on the winning side, I want to come back and consider if, if we really should have right. done this or not. Yeah, yeah. Which is wise. I'm glad that people can change their minds. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that was all of 15, so back to you. 16, adjournment. A motion motion to adjourn is in order when made by a duly recognized delegate and is not debatable. It is not in order when another delegate has the floor, when a question is pending or a vote is being conducted, when the previous question has been ordered and action is pending when a motion to adjourn has been defeated and no business or debate has intervened or when the motion to fix the time for the conference to adjourn is pending okay so you can't say i want to adjourn the conference if all of these if one of these things is going on I don't know if it has to be adjourn the conference, but adjourn Adjourn the session. Okay, the session. Okay. But you can't do that if you're in the middle of something. So to use the United Methodist example, there was that African dude that was talking, and that one white chick got up and said, "Uh, I'm hungry. Let's get lunch. That would be inappropriate. But if you wait till that matter has been resolved, then you can get up and say, I want to make a motion to adjourn. Let's pick back up later. Okay. Okay. Yeah, nothing to say on that. Point 17, unfinished business. 
All valid petitions submitted to the General Conference must be acted upon by a legislative committee that will either approve or disapprove or refer it. All petitions approved by a legislative committee must be acted upon by the plenary session, which would also approve, disapprove, or refer it. I think this is John Lomperis. He he put something in place like this for the United Methodist Church, which was why they had all these big, huge consent calendars because they had to entertain. They had to, they had to actually vote on this stuff, so they yeah. just threw it all in there and said, oh, vote on it. We don't want to extend this any longer. Uh -huh. That's, yeah. So that was an unfortunate part of it, but at least it got considered rather than what's happened in previous settings, which is let's not even entertain it. Let's just – it's DOA. We don't, we don't even want to – you had to entertain it. It had to come before the plenary. And technically, it did come before the, the plenary. You can take something off the consent calendar if it needs to be addressed. It, you can. And so I don't know how this is managed because the thing that this is obviously up against is like the cutoff time for the conference in general. Right. So I don't, I don't know how you do this. I'm not going to be figuring that out. I'm not going to be there. Well, didn't we talk about like, I, I thought there was the option if it doesn't get resolved in this session, then it automatically goes on to the next one. Yeah, good memory. Yeah, that was definitely something that has been spelled out. Yeah, yeah, which is, I mean, I feel like that makes sense. Like those would be should be should be the first ones that come up the next next time they get together. Right, yeah, I wonder. Just tacked on to the end. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It'd be fun if we just punted something every six years. Ah, oh, shucks, we didn't have time for it again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is why I said you should you have to, that should be the first thing you, you deal with. There used to be a late night show. I forget which host it was, but they would have Matt Damon on at the last minute, ask him one question, and in the middle of his answer say, oh, sorry, we're out of time. And then he would is lose his Craig mind. Ferguson? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. This was a long time ago, back when I was funny. Oh, okay. Or at least I found that funny. All right, you want to get on to uh, decorum? Yeah, four. Okay. Decorum at the general conference. A... Delegates and guests of the general commons are expected to conduct themselves at all times in accordance with biblical virtues of kindness, compassion, charitable conversation, and respect for all individuals as those who bear the image of God. Non-delegates are not allowed within the bar of the general conference except by the approval of the voting delegates. I thought you were going to say something. You were just nope, breathing. just breathing. Sorry. Okay. Delegates are also expected not to distract others with cell phone usage during proceedings of the body or committee thank you that's yeah turn your turn your ringer off nobody wants to hear it get a watch that vibrates and stop it likewise the use of that's not in there i just that was this uh, tangent like this is back to the document yes. likewise the use of social media to denigrate others is neither in keeping with the spirit of christ or the spirit of the general conference okay so don't bash people on social media yeah fair enough yeah yeah, yeah you can get in trouble for that i was kind of wishing for the good old days once upon a time methodist when they had conferences were all wearing suits i was thinking how cool would that be if everybody had to wear a suit <laughs> they don't make that mandatory oh uh, yeah it's yeah, suits are expensive man if you don't have a suit and you're a preacher you gotta have a suit I, I know I that might be fair. a class thing, but it's just, you know, uh, it is what it is. I mm. don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah. it's not mandatory here, so I guess you don't have to have a suit if you don't want to. But seriously, if you're a guy, preacher at least, if you're a male preacher, a man preacher, uh, you should have one for funerals. I mean, there's just... <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's kind of tacky to show up at a funeral in jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah. Or jeans in general. Yeah. Like here in Oklahoma, you could have like boots and jeans and a button-up and a bolo. And but you still need a suit jacket. I guess if the, if that particular person's like cowboyish, then right. Should, okay, I yeah. guess that's passable. Like I still still feel like it's like ah. Eh. But I've seen people at, at annual conference, and I've been one of them because the standards are so low. In like shorts and a t-shirt and sneakers, and at that point, it's just like, dude. I, see, I don't, I, I don't know how. I'm not. If it's general conference, I don't feel as obligated to to have a dress code. I don't know why. Like in my head, it's just. I don't well, know. we'll see how you feel whenever we see the first person get up at the microphone, where it's just like they're out at Walmart or something. Oh, well, it, okay. That, when you say you're out at Walmart, I'm thinking like somebody in pajamas. In which case, uh -huh. that is never acceptable. Don't do that, even if you're going to Walmart. It's weird. Don't wear your pajamas outside. There will be people. I guarantee you, there are going to be people at this general conference. Probably not. They will almost certainly be from America who are just like they've got their beach shirt on. Oh, and they're oh like, I'm yeah, going no. to the beach after this. Yeah, I feel like 
delegates outside the U.S. take it a little more seriously. Uh-huh. And uh, like, they you can dress up. Like, it's the U.S. It's the U.S. people that are the problem. <laughs> U.S. delegates consider taking it seriously and showing that in your, your outward present, presentation to delegates. Some khakis and a nice dress shirt. So, um, uh, no, I, I wonder how strict they are about cell phone usage. Like, I know that at some annual conferences, and probably at this last United Methodist General Conference, that's how they coordinated votes. You know, last yeah. minute, as things are changing on the floor and people are using Robert's rules, it's really helpful to have someone smarter than you going, okay, here's the thing we talked about, here's what we want, if you still want this, vote this way. But if you can't have any cell phone, well, I didn't know. I didn't read it as that. It's just not to distract others with cell phone usage. Yeah. So not like, don't. Oh, and this is just in general another tangent I'm getting. I like, don't speak on speakerphone. Like if you're right <laughs> in around people, like just stop it. <laughs> Nobody else wants to hear your conversation. Get some headphones. Put it up to your ear. You're you're not that important. Nobody cares. We're changing um, the world here. <laughs> We're changing the world. We're solving the world's problems. But it is a problem. Yeah. What about like? Um, lifting your phone up on the floor plenary and taking selfies with your buddies, would that be distracting? Only if Flash is on. Yeah. You would make a good communications czar. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I just, if it's distra- I, don't, I don't feel like selfies are that distracting, unless it's like... No Flash for you! Yeah, unless it's in the middle of, like, you're doing something, and, like, you need to be paying... You should be paying attention the entire time. Um, but... If it's particularly boring, I guess you want to take a selfie. Take a selfie. I don't have a problem. We're we're um, we're figuring out his wedding in a couple months, and I don't like photographers getting out in the middle of things and taking photos. But TJ's been saying, oh, "I got to have these photos," so she's getting in the middle of things. Yeah, so. she wants to get in the middle. Of it. Like I, I paid a lot of money for the photographer. Get up there, take the pictures. You other persnickety people, if you have opinions on these things, we would love you to put them in the uh, comments, especially if you agree with me that TJ is wrong. Well, if you also hate Flash or people talking on speakerphone, just put it in there. Make me feel like I'm right. I know I'm right, but anyways. Let's go to B. Uh, demonstrations designed to disrupt or delay disrupt or delay the work of the conference will not be allowed within the space where the plenary session or committee meetings are being held, including virtual electronic meetings. The presiding officer of the affected meeting may use his or her discretion, his or her discretion to have any who violate the decorum of the conference, including those within the gallery, immediately immediately removed from the assembly room or virtual meeting. Such removal covers only the current session unless they are repeated violated. They are repeated violations. There are repeated violations. Wow, I am a literate Oklahoma today. The presiding officer's decision to expel a person may be overturned by a majority vote of the body. Interesting. Marshals may be asked to assist in the removal of such violators. Okay, so... No demonstrations. There have been demonstrations in the past on the floor of general conferences at United Methodist Church. We don't want to have that again. Well, it just says that are designed to disrupt or delay so i would assume stuff that's like loud and obnoxious but if you're just holding signs and sitting in the corner i would think that it's fine yeah i think that's probably maybe right. i guess i guess it's up to the presiding officer at that point mm-hmm. um but if the presiding officer says y'all are out of order get out of here then somebody can get up and say uh i want to take a vote on this Let's uh, vote. Uh, I kind of like him being here. So <laughs> hypothetically, yeah, yeah. So the what's the vote um, threshold? Presiding officer may majority may be overturned. Vote. Yeah, majority vote of the body. So fifty percent plus one says no. Actually, we like these demonstrators. They're yeah. like wearing uh, flamingo suits or whatever. And on then the, the, the chair the just has to go. Today. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I got it. Uh, but yeah, then the chair just has to go, all right, if y'all want these weirdos in pink suits here, then yeah, they can yeah. stay. Yeah. But then uh, if someone is making a demonstration and they refuse to leave, that's when we get to see the marshals come out and do their job. Yeah. That'd be nice. I want to know how they're selecting marshals. I don't know. Hopefully by uh, body mass. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, bench press or something. I don't know. You got to do this many pull-ups before you can be a marshal. I like it. I like it. Okay. All right. C. 
Should there be undue tensions or anxieties affecting the work of the delegates, the presiding officer may also pause the proceedings of the conference at any moment, any moment in order to have a time of prayer. Okay, that's fine. Um, for security reasons, sessions of the general conference may be closed to non-delegates upon a two-thirds vote of the body. In such cases, the session should continue to be live streamed unless security reasons warrant otherwise. So it's all of a idea. sudden at plenary, all the delegates are looking around and like everybody's around them wearing like gorilla masks or something. And they're very intimidated. They say, hey, chair, we need to get all these people out of here so we can conduct our affairs without feeling intimidated. Mm -hmm. Is that a was that a majority vote? Uh, two thirds. Okay. Two thirds vote. We're feeling intimidated. Y'all get out of here. They still can't cut the live stream though. There's still going to be mm -hmm. visible evidence, a record of, of what is transpiring. Yeah. I feel like that's a good rule. That makes sense to me. Sure. Yeah. Don't intimidate delegates. Yeah. Uh, D distribution of materials that are relevant to the issues under consideration may be made outside of the bar of the conference or a legislative committee provided provided that such distribution is done in a way that is respectful and non-invasive of the delegate's personal space or privacy. Distributors are responsible for the disposal of any unused or unclaimed materials. So in the UMC, this was a, 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 an area of anxiety where people would want to spread information about things coming before the body that the institution didn't like. Mm -hmm. So they would set like boundaries of here's where you can give out materials. And then depending on the conference, sometimes it'd be like way out of the way where they, they wouldn't even have access to the delegates. There was an episode with Gary Graves, who was the head of the general conference, the, who, who would like yell at people and like get in their way whenever they tried to give out materials to other people at the general conference. So yeah. here it's g having a much more libertine approach to handing out materials as long as you're respectful. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some case that's annoying, but whatever. You want to pass out flyers, go for it. Well, and the next one deals kind of with that too, but it's with non-legislative materials, so okay. go ahead. E, distribution of non-legislative materials to the delegates within the bar will be allowed only upon the permission of the agenda committee. Distribution within the bar of the legislative materials, not part of the legislative of the limited agenda, as determined by the petition secretary and the reference committee, will be allowed only upon approval of two thirds vote of the delegates. What, what is some kind of non legislative? material that they were wanting to pass out party in tj's room tonight at 10 p.m byob i, I don't know think, yeah yeah i guess i don't know that just seems weird that you want to print all these things out and distribute them even though it's not relevant like just set up a booth or if it's just like i don't know we've got a new ministry we're starting here go to this website to learn more about it or something yeah set up a booth but also if you want to get something in everybody's hands you can be, do that just run it by and, the agenda committee yeah, be annoying and then go out and handed out while they're doing business or while in between things either way the agenda committee will let you know when and how you can do it i guess but i mean it's like it's like email you get on somebody's email list you, you, everything goes well for you so you might annoy them by sending too many emails but that's the decision that companies make is it's better to annoy people annoy than people. to not even well, yeah, i guess i guess all right last one point five Amending the plan and covenant. Adoption of the plan of organization and the covenant for ordering our life together at the beginning of the conference is by a two-thirds vote, but amendments at that time only require a majority vote for approval. Subsequent to the initial adoption, the plan and covenant may be amended, changed, or suspended by a two-thirds vote of the general conference. In any parliamentary situation not covered under this plan or covenant, the general conference will be governed in its action by the current edition of Robert's Rules of Order. So this is just saying the at the very start, this whole document is going to be adopted by these margins. Makes sense. All right. Is that that is the last thing 
you know, there is no more space here at the bottom. It's 16 pages. We took four weeks to do it. We probably could have done it faster, but uh, we did it how we did it, and it's hopefully good enough for you. So I'm going to need to review it a couple more times before general conference comes so that I know how to give good coverage during the time. You are planning a live stream. I'm hoping to, yeah. yeah. I, have, I haven't gotten official permission to do so yet. Um, I'm probably going to be more generous than I was to the United Methodists. Um, although if it goes crazy, I mean, I'm, I do want to be able to say disapproving things if I want to, and I don't know right. if they're going to be okay with that or not. But um, I, I, yeah, I don't foresee any issues. There's definitely some bitterness from the UMC, so that's. I, I'm hopeful that the leadership wants to show, hey, we're not afraid of anything. We're going to be transparent. We trust outsiders to look at what's going on and comment. I, I do think, you know, I learned some helpful things from live streaming the UMC one, just about like putting a statement on screen saying, I am not affiliated. Uh, I'm not expressing the official views of this denomination. This right. is just private commentary. Um, so I'll, I'll figure out what needs to be said and put in the the writing uh, show notes and stuff so that. Well, I feel like the GMC will be more, uh, well, I believe you've got a, a main YouTube channel um, yeah. that they are probably going to stream from the umc didn't do that they got like 15 different channels it was not clear like that was one of their excuses was oh well it, it wasn't clear that uh, uh it, this is not the official live stream and it's because of them because they weren't clear on like where they like they posted on the website sure but most people are going to go to youtube to watch it because it's easier i um, mean that's what they did and the first thing that came up was was your channel was it really i i yeah. outperformed them in the search really yeah, yeah, because it was like on a weird, like I had to go back and find it. It was a weird, like secondary page. Like it wasn't the main UMC page. It right. was like a, I don't even remember the name of it, of it, but it took me a while to find it, just to find it. Yeah, at one point, so I have found myself wondering, like, if they are okay with me live streaming and commenting. I wonder if my feed would be as big as the denominational feed or not. So I don't want to, like, Anyway, no, I, it GMCs. got that way. At the UMC one, at yeah. one point, I had almost as many viewers as the people watching the original live stream. Yeah, yeah. Which would be cool. I don't know. I like it. So anyway, if y'all have any thoughts on how it is that uh, I should be running things whenever the time comes, things to keep in mind, uh, then I'd like to know that. You can email me at plainspokenpod at gmail.com. You can put it in the comments. We do read the comments. Appreciation again to Kerry Wood, who uh, had his expertise that he offered on the last episode. We're, uh, we're going to continue to talk about how it is that we're going to review the petitions that we submitted, provide the rationale for delegates who are going to be entertaining it on the legislative committees. But also, if you submitted petitions that you'd like us to review and, and look at the merits of, then we might do that. I think that'd be cool. Just to see what everybody else is submitting. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the petitions came from uh, the uh, – what's that, what's that committee? What's that uh, – The TLC? The people, the TLC. Yeah, yeah, the Transitional Leadership Committee. Yeah, but a lot more came from local churches and annual conferences and individual GMC members than I think. I think it would just be nice to see what other people are actually worried about. Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah uh, Nathaniel Fugate. Uh, who I interviewed on the topic of abortion, him and his wife, he sent me one. I, th I assumed it would be about abortion. It wasn't. It was about re-adding um, Wesley's standards, sermons, and I forget what else to our uh, doctrinal standards because they always have been. I guess they're not there. I didn't even notice this. Mm. So anyway, yeah, we're going to be all over the map with things that are offered, and so it'd be fun to, to talk it through. We might even – I'm trying to convince TJ uh, – well, we – we could probably interview people directly about their petitions as we tear them apart. Logistically, that would uh, be a little more complicated, but theoretically we could. Yeah. Hypothetically, we could. And I don't think we're going to be tearing them apart. I was being kind of silly. So um, I've been thinking about another series. I'm going to get your initial reaction from this, but I was I thinking... Um, <laughs> I feel like you know what my initial reaction to new stuff is generally. <laughs> yeah, you don't like new things. But think about this idea, because in the global Methodist church, it should be everybody's concern. Um, the purpose of annual conferences, in general conference originally, was let's make sure we're all preaching the same thing, that we're all ministering to people in the same way. Well, conferences are a great way to do that, but another great way to do that is to review what people are actually preaching. And so I was thinking we have a series where people say, hey, would you review a sermon that I felt really good about this one? What do you guys think? Do you want to 
walk through it. Somebody submits their own. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we well, don't you're... pick on other GMC clergy, but they come to us and they say, hey, what do you, you and TJ pick it apart and see if it passes your standard or something. Do you think anybody would want to do that? I don't know. Maybe if you do, I like I, I we had talked about that before. We're just picking a sermon and going over it. Some right. some random person's sermon. Um, but no, I think that'd be interesting. I, I would be okay with that. Maybe get Robbie in here to do that. Cause Robbie's wise. Yeah. We like Robbie. Yeah. So. Robbie has good taste. Yeah. I, uh, okay. Uh, I'm interested in you guys. There might be nobody who wants to get reviewed by us. I don't know. Maybe we're, we're too mean, but I just think it'd be good for like a common sense of like, okay, what is the purpose of preaching? What doctrines can we bring in a good way from the pulpit? You know, right. tricks of the trade. And yeah, sometimes we'd say mean things, but other times I can imagine us going, that was really good delivery. I feel like we'd be a little bit generous if somebody's submitting their own right, petition. Yeah. Like, we're not going to be super mean. Right. Unless I'm in a bad mood, so. And then I'll just say, this is not <laughs> a good now. day for TJ. Yeah. We'll do this again sometime. <laughs> but yeah, well, I think we will have other people's sermons that we review that we're more critical about, but we're not inclined to be that way with towards GMC Yeah, no, folk. no. Okay. Unless it's blatantly heretical, in which case we will be mean. And you should be afraid. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, okay. We've, we've covered a lot of stuff for you all to respond to and pray about. And uh, I did not think we'd be going this long after three pages. But uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're at the end here. So I uh, just want to thank you guys for being along with us for the ride. And it's been fun. And uh, we'll see where we go from here. But uh, may God bless you and your ministry and your church as you prepare for the convening conference. Uh, as we've said in our stuff before. We're really optimistic about this. We think that they've put together a really good program here. It should be a lot of fun to watch. We're very optimistic about what's going to come of it. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it'll be good. All right. Well, then we're going to say goodbye now, and we'll see you soon.